And now, Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. Hey, everybody, what's going on? Welcome to Move the Sticks. DJ, Bucky, and Lance in for the show today. I, although, Lance, I should say right now, we're minus Bucky because we've got a little situation outside the uh, NFL Network. We've got a truck blocking the entrance. Bucky is <laughs> cannot get into the parking lot. Uh, so, look, we, we, we talk every day during this time of year. We're talking about players, and uh, pass protection is big, and i got to give this truck a lot of credit because there is nothing getting by that truck right now. It is an impenetrable force there in front wide of the parking lot. Wide frame's important. Yeah, that's where you start. You want you want a wide frame to start with, and it's you know make it tougher to get around. No doubt. Uh, so we'll, hopefully Bucky will be in here shortly. But uh, in the meantime, we're going to talk about Lance, uh, your latest mock draft. Kind of uh, go through that one, look at some different trends or storylines, noteworthy picks, have some fun with that. Uh, then I want to have the discussion about the importance of marrying free agency in the draft. It's something that every team in the league is going through really this week. Uh, most teams I've talked to over the last seven days finishing up their free agent meetings, they get a little tiny break, and then they're right into draft meetings. So how do you marry up your free agent board with your draft board and then the importance of getting that draft board up on the wall before the combine? want to have that conversation as well. But first of all, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. We're, uh, we're plowing through. Uh, Lots of lot more players for for us to watch here as we get towards the combine, but we're we're getting there, man. Speeds I, it up. I once, use, uh, I use once, Phil Savage. Once you get the combine list of oh, players, like say, oh wow, I got way oh, more to do than rolling. I thought. That is so true. I use uh, Phil Savage, who uh, I work for with the Ravens and with the Browns. He used to always use the phrase, "Just advance the ball. Um, don't worry about the finish line. Just every day, just advance the ball. Keep 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 at it. Keep grinding away, and eventually you'll get to the finish line." So uh, that's what that's what we're forced to do here. Uh, let's jump into your mock draft here, okay. Lance. I want to take a peek at this thing. Um, we'll start off here at the very top. Uh, no surprises with the first two picks, Burrow and Chase Young, uh, Bengals, Redskins. We get to pick number three. Um, this has been, you know, we've talked about it a bunch already. It's kind of the trade spot there. But when you look at players and fits, man, I think Jeffrey Okuda, you, you, who you have going there, I agree with you. I think that is the perfect player uh, for, for team fit, scheme fit, all that stuff. But I also think I might be able to still trade back a little bit and still get him. Yeah, that could be the... Uh Tua spot. And of course, everything we talk about with Tua, as you know, we have to, it's predicated on depending on how his medicals check out at the combine or even on the recheck. Because yeah. it may not even be by the combine, it may be the recheck. So once you know what Tua's health looks like and future health look, uh, looks like, and what once teams know and teams have determined and team doctors have determined, then you can start to talk about Tua. Once he gets the, the thumbs up, and if he gets a thumbs up, then everyone knows number five, Miami, is the danger zone. And so three and four become mm -hmm. the positions that you think are potential trade positions. And and like you said, Akuda to me, is one of the top five players in this draft. And I think he fits Detroit easily. But if Detroit, who's not one or two players away, they're, they're a little further away, if Detroit can get a, a, a great deal to move back, I, I, I think I'd have to think that would be something that would appeal to them. There's three guys, I think. Obviously, we, we you know, Burrow and Chase Young seem to be established one and two. Oh, my goodness, he made it in. He got past the, he got past the truck that was blocked. <laughs> so I heard Makai Becton Bucky was, was out there. Oh, man, it was so, it was so much drama outside. Like, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of angry people going down uh, Washington Boulevard because a truck decided to try and pull in the NFL network and doesn't necessarily fit, so... You know how it goes. Uh, that's a way to persevere, Buck. That's yeah. what you need. You know, look, the Chiefs were down by 10 points at the you know, with six <laughs> minutes made to it. go. They found a way. Look at you. It Find made a way into the parking lot. It made it. I did want to weigh in because I heard you guys talk fantastic. about I uh, heard you guys talk about Jeff Akuda going to the Detroit Lions and schematically and player-wise, I think is a great fit. It's just a thing where we haven't seen the Lions expend a pick on a first round corner since 1998. That was Terry Fair coming out of Tennessee. Mm. And so would this be the year that they finally kind of break their traditional trend and, and pick up a guy because, look, uh, I think it's obvious that they need someone that can lock it down, someone that can play obviously opposite big play slay. Um, but from a franchise standpoint, they 
traditionally haven't done this. Yeah, but I think I think you can throw a little bit of that out just because they've had so many regimes over the years, and this is the this is the New England group, Buck. And I, I think when you look at Okuda, I, to me, Stefan Gilmore is who he is. And so if you look at Patricia, look at his mm-hmm. tree, look at Belichick, look at their emphasis on building almost back to front instead of front to back. Um, I think that's why I would say that one makes a little more sense than than normal. You're right though, because they do they are a team that plays coverage more than pressure. And so if you're going to do that, you need to have guys that can run all over the field. Let's keep it moving. Let's okay. get to four with yeah. Isaiah Simmons because I, I think Isaiah Simmons is one of the best players in the draft. I think he is absolutely worthy of the fourth pick. But the Giants, and that is a longer track record with a lot of the same guys in that building, that does not seem like their M.O. to go away from a big guy there at number four. I know Wills. Um, you had Becton and Bucky had Wills. And, I, you know, I like both those guys. And I think Wills is the best tackle in the draft for me. However, what I tried to do was think of someone for – James Betcher to deploy around the, the the field. He's a very Isaiah Simmons is a very very rare player, right? He's a guy that can match up with quarterbacks as a spy. He can match up with zone read type concepts. He can play, you know, a safety spot. He can play linebacker. He can ru- rush off the edge. I just think he's a very unique piece that could entice the Giants to say, you know what? Because this is a little deeper tackle draft, let's take a shot at getting a defensive player that is a rare um, matchup player defensively. We know about all these matchup offensive players, right? That's, that's, that's the word. Uh, he's a matchup tight end. I, uh, uh, Kamara's a matchup running back out of the backfield. How about defensive? How about the defense now get some matchup guys? And that's what Isaiah Simmons is to me. He's a rare matchup piece. And frankly, in my Mach 1, I also like to throw a little curveball in there early to see what the contingencies look like for the teams right behind them. And I think Isaiah Simmons is a guy that once he tests, everyone's going to be blown away. And he's, you know, it, people are going to be very intrigued by Isaiah Simmons. Buck, we've talked about this. I mean, he's, he's my fourth overall player. He's one of my favorite players in the whole draft because of that versatility that he allows your defense. I, I, I get it from that logical standpoint, and I would, I would love the pick if they made it. I just think when you draft a, a franchise quarterback the year before, um, usually these guys are so narrow focused on what do we have to do to help him be successful. And as great as Isaiah Simmons is, I just think that you know trying to get somebody to protect Daniel Jones because Nate Solder was awful, mm. awful last year. Um, they've got they've got to uh, to be better up front. Yeah, I think it has to be a huge priority. I, I actually like the pick on paper, but Jim, when I think about the franchise and how they want to get Daniel Jones up and running, you would like to think that an offensive tackle, and also looking at Gettleman's history, he has a big uh, affinity for what he calls the hog mollies, the big guys, the big guys up front mm-hmm. on offense and defense. He typically builds his team from the trenches out. Somebody that is big is going to be someone that is in play there, even though Isaiah Simmons might be a better fit in terms of getting them another blue chip player. All right, Lance, final word on that. Give us your final word on that. Close the door on number four, and then get us to the back-to-back quarterbacks and your explanation there, five and six. Well, I think the final word on this one is that the Giants, I think, could because it is a little deeper tackle draft, they're another pick that could potentially be a trade-out pick. And I have Isaiah Simmons there, but that's, you know, could also be a placeholder because if you like tackles and if you have them, even two of them evenly matched up, you could roll back into six, into seven, uh, into eight, and I think still get a tackle that you really, really love. As far as five and six, so five, I went to it to the Miami Dolphins. I, I, that's kind of standard fare. I understand that. We've been doing that for a while. I know Gil Brand has talked about mm-hmm. that Miami really loves Justin Herbert. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I think we'll find out more as we get closer to the combine and specifically after the combine. But Tua is, I believe, going to be a redshirt player his first year. I think physically you have to make sure he's 100% healthy. And if that's the case, Miami right now has so much draft capital that they really can, if they're wise about it, they really can build for the future. And if Tua is as talented as we think he is, and he's got some rare twitch in his feet and his hands and you know, and he's and he's got a nice body of work there over at uh, uh, over at Alabama. Then why not take him, sit him if you need to, for however long you need to, to make sure he's healthy and and you get got the Fitzpatrick. building blocks around him. Yeah, but you got to get the quarterback though. 
And you can let Fitzpatrick do whatever no, he needs I'm to saying, do. No, I'm saying yeah. for the year. Right, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just saying you, you want to get to it. you you got a year, buy some time. Fitzpatrick gets you through the next year. Yeah, I like. I mean, I like all of that. I, I, I think two is a great fit for them in terms of how he plays. I think when we look at how this offense will evolve under Chan Gailey, Chan Gailey likes to get the ball out uh, of the quarterback's hands quickly. He wants to spread the field. They have a number of empty sets, and he wants to kind of put it in the quarterback's hands to identify the open matchup, get it out quick, and allow those playmakers to work. Work. It worked with Fitzpatrick way back in the day in Buffalo. And because Fitzpatrick has that natural connection with Chan Gailey, it is an easy red shirt situation for the Miami Dolphins. I think this should be the pick for them. Get a young quarterback that uh, can be their quarterback for the next 10 years. And you give him an opportunity to red shirt, which is something that we really don't see happen often. But because Pat Mahomes has had success, I think you'll see others that say maybe that is the right blue plan. Lance, I want to ask you one question about that because to me, I think Bucky mentioned Chan Gailey's name there, and uh, this is what's fascinating to me about Chan Gailey. So when he when he came back, let's see, he goes to Georgia Tech, o two to o seven. Okay, Kansas City Chiefs, he's their offensive coordinator for one year. Mm-hmm. Buffalo Bills, he's there from two thousand ten to two thousand twelve. The New York Jets, he's there fifteen sixteen. I mean, he. He has not been able to stay established anywhere longer than really two years for going back. Gosh, we're going all the way back to 2007. Like, he's had no longevity there as an offensive coordinator. That, to me, worries me a little bit about having a, a young quarterback. I'm, I'm hoping you're going to have somebody in there that can be there and let this guy develop and, and ride out. But, man, there's nothing in the, in the recent history that will show you that's going to happen. Yeah, I would agree with you. And I think that's probably why the Panthers went out and looked at Joe Brady. Besides the fact that Joe Brady was the hot name, but you know, if you're Matt Rule, that you have a younger guy ready to pair with a younger quarterback if and when you make that move. Or if you're, if you're bought in on Will Greer or Kyle Allen, or maybe you think you still have a lot more to go with Cam Newton. Um, with Chan Gailey, I'm, I'm of the same mind. Of uh, Look, I like the quick game and everything that he does with Tua because I think that's who Tua is. However, I do think that Tua can fit into pro-style offensive attacks. I think he can handle boot action stuff. I think Tua, much more so than, than Joe Burrow, can fit into a variety of offenses and have a chance to succeed. So I do think from that standpoint, you know, I, I, I like schematic matches with a variety of different concepts with Tua. But personality-wise, I do wonder sometimes if Chan Gailey is one of those guys who can he sit down and have a relationship with a quarterback for an extended period of time? Because you're right. It's something we haven't seen for a long, long time with Gailey. It's funny, but I'm going to go all the way back to when Chan Gailey was in Kansas City. When Chan Gailey was the offensive coordinator in Kansas City, his quarterback for a time there was Tyler Thigpen. Tyler Thigpen played at Coastal Carolina. Mm-hmm. And what Chan Gailey did back then, and he won't get credit for, he really introduced the National Football League to the spread. They were running pistol. They were doing some RPO stuff. He was really ahead of the game. And I think what Brian Flores and the guys at Miami won is, look, Everyone is talking about the young, trendy coach, but experience matters. I think maybe with Chan Gailey, you get a little bit of both. You get the guy who understands the innovative trends while also having enough experience to be able to have some of the answers to the test when defensive coordinators catch up to the initial version of the offense. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to watch how that all, all rolls together here. Uh, Buck, why don't you take us through the next uh, four to five here and what you think? You know, so what's interesting is like when we get to the Carolina Panthers and Derek Brown linking up there, Jedrick Willis Wills going to the Arizona Cardinals, Javon Kinlaw going to the Jacksonville Jaguars at nine, and then finishing up in Cleveland with Tristan Wirfs going to the Browns. I mean, we talked about the bigs. The bigs came off of those next four picks. I love Derek Brown going to the Carolina Panthers. Um, when I watched him, I, look, I, I hate to throw this out there, but the way that he throws people around sometimes in the SEC reminds me of oh my old, gosh, it reminds me of my old teammate Reggie White. I don't want to put that on him, <laughs> but his strength is grown man strength and how hard he plays. Uncommon to find someone that big that's kind of that decorated that plays with that kind of motor. He's a fun one to watch. I mean, I, I want I mean, I won't even shy away from the man crush that I have on him watching tape. For me, Derek Brown, I was shocked. Last year, I wrote Derek Brown up expecting him to come out. And I had what would amount to a yep. 15th or 16th pick of the draft. And I, you know, I had plenty of weaknesses on there and things to work on. And he had his strengths. He went back to school, and I thought, well, that's smart. He went back to school. I think he'll become a better player. Uh, honestly, I was shocked at what he became because one of the issues he had in 2018 was he took some plays off, and the motor didn't always stay lit. 
it stayed lit this year. And not only did he play with a great motor, but he was dominant. And he understood physically that he was dominant in, in, with the guy in front of him. That's something Javon Kenlaw hasn't figured out yet. For example, Kenlaw is physically a dominant, imposing player. He hasn't figured out yet that he's going to be stronger and more physically capable than most of the players across from him. Derek Brown figured that out, kept the motor running hot, and made himself, to me, a lot of money. But more importantly than you know, moving up slots in the draft, he became a better football player. And had he not gone back to school, that might not have happened on the run in the NFL, on the fly. That doesn't always happen for players that where they just continue to develop. Sometimes that year in college can, can be a development year that you don't get in, uh, in, in pro football. And I think that was big for Derek Brown's future success. I got, I got a quick question, Lance. I, uh, I want, go ahead, Buck. Quick question, just in terms of like stacking the board, right? So I know mock drafts are mock drafts. They're not necessarily the way that you view players. Um, from an overall player gap, how big is the separation between Chase Young and Derek Brown? Uh, I don't have it very big at all. I got a 7-3 on Young, and I got a 7-1-9 on Derek Brown. So it's, as, da- as Daniel knows from the grading scale, it's, it's pretty close. Mm-hmm. It's you, pretty close. I, do I don't think there's a huge got, difference. Buck, I've got a 7-0 on Chase Young, and I've got a 7-0 on Derek Brown. So mm. that's what I, that's, I have the exact same grade on both. Yeah, so it's, so it's funny. I, I they're, they're yeah, right there. Yeah, because when I'm looking, I'm like, man, this dude is a dominant. Like, it's a dominant player. And I know it's been kind of like a foregone conclusion that, hey, you know, Chase Young is going number two. But then when I sit back and I reach, and I love Chase Young, but I'm looking at Derek Brown like, man, Derek Brown should – be more in that conversation as being one of the best players on the defense side of the ball, if not the best player, uh, when, it, when, when you pop in the tape and you kind of do the overall evaluation. And you know what else is funny is yeah. that when you have a dominant interior player, it's in many cases more valuable than a very good edge rusher. I know edge rusher gets all the love, but when you have somebody who can wreck it from the interior – like Aaron Donald, that throws everything off. It throws, it, it throws your protection off. It throws your run blocking schemes off. When you can't handle, and usually tackles are going to be better than guards, anyway. So some of the guards who start in the league and some of the guard center tandems, not good at all. You throw a guy like Derek Brown in there. If you knew for a fact that he could be the same type of player on in the pros, you could make an argument that you're still projecting Chase Young because you are. He's still very much a projection player where the tape is a production tape for Derek Brown. It's a little different between mm-hmm. the two. Interesting thing, though. I think there's a little bit of fear because of Quentin Williams and what was expected of him and what was delivered, which was well short of expectation yeah. along with an interior player. Yeah. Um, I think there's a little bit of that. I think I think Derek Brown's a better player. I actually have a higher grade on him than even I had on, on Quentin uh, coming out of last year's draft. But th- that's always a thought. The, the other thing I want to hit you on, Lance, is uh, – Two interesting things here. When you look at, obviously, we know the quarterbacks' spots. We're looking five, six, seven as kind of those quarterback spots. But then I see us getting into offensive tackle alley here, because I think you look at the Arizona Cardinals at eight, uh, the Cleveland Browns at ten, the Jets at eleven. You have you have them all going offensive tackles. They all have a needed offensive tackle. Um, that to me is the interesting thing. If you're if you're a team like the Giants that wants to trade back a little bit and go after a tackle. You got to be careful there because that is that is where that run is going to take place, and they are going to fly off the board. And the other point I would make there is, I'm fascinated to see the Arizona Cardinals what they do building their roster because you go back and look at Cliff Kingsbury with Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech with all that offense and no defense, and it didn't amount to a whole lot of wins. I understand you've got to protect Kyler Murray in a division where you've got San Francisco and Seattle that can and the Rams that can really really rush the passer. You want to build up that side of the ball. But they've got to be careful that they don't make the same mistake at the NFL level that they made at the collegiate level there at Texas Tech and build a lopsided team. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do here in this draft. Yeah, I think that's fair. But the difference is in the Big 12, I mean, Texas Tech, it's not like Texas Tech didn't want defensive talent. It's just really, really hard to get the best defensive talent because the best defensive talent is going out of the state or at the big spotlight schools in the state. And Texas Tech had difficulty doing that. And they've always had trouble uh, recruiting, you know, recruiting defensive players. And I think you could say that besides Texas Tech, you can say that about a lot of offensive minded teams is that they tend to, you know, shy away from putting in the necessary draft capital to take care of their defensive side. When you look at the tackle position, though, and, and, 
and you have a rare quarterback who can keep himself protected with his feet at times, but not forever. And you, I just don't know how you can pass up on a quality tackle when that's been such an issue for you for so long. I mean, you had Jared Veldier there who was, who was okay. He was okay. And DJ Humphreys is okay, but you need to get somebody that you can build mm-hmm. around. And if, you know, and in my scenario, I've got Jedrick Wills there. To me, I just think he's too good a football player to pass up on. But I understand what you're saying. And who, who would you look at defensively then, DJ, for example, in that spot for a team like Arizona with their needs? I'm taking a tackle with that pick. I mean, I 100% oh, okay. I'm taking an offensive tackle with that pick. I'm saying a big picture. I'm talking about free agency. I'm talking about the rest of the draft. They've, they've got to make sure that they're allocating resources there to get a defense that's, that's not very good and in good spot. But there, to me, I don't, I don't think they really have a choice because as much as we talk about the depth of the offensive tackle class, trust me, what – you look at every team, almost darn near every team needs one. So if you want to if you want to kick the can down the road to the second round and think, oh, we've got seven tackles we like, good luck. Uh, those guys are going to go boom, 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 boom. Yeah, they are going to go. I, DJ, I think it's funny because I, you bring up a, a, a great point and one that we should probably expand on on maybe another episode about not building a lopsided team. I do wonder now that Kansas City has won the Super Bowl, and when we think about – their model, right? Because I would say that the Kansas City Chiefs are a little lopsided in terms of the way their talent is kind of distributed. They have all of this offensive talent, uh, Tyreek Hill, Sammy Watkins, Travis Kelsey. You have the uh, premier quarterback in Pat Mahomes. But then really when you look at their defense, I mean, they have Frank Clark. They have the Honey Badger. They've got three stars, though. Yeah, you know, so... Chris Jones, Frank Clark, and the Honey Badger are three legit all-pro right. players. No, no, no. I, so I get that. So when we talk about the Arizona Cardinals and building that model, they have the pass rusher and Chandler Jones. Uh, say what you want to about Patrick Peterson. He could be that thing. They do need another star player on the defense side of the ball. The problem is, man, when they invested in that, what... Hassan Reddick, what, what what pick did they take Hassan Reddick? Like they invested a big pick in him, and he the hasn't teens, been, yeah. yeah, he hasn't been that thing. So the next time they do take one, if they take an offensive tackle, they have to get some star power on that side. I just thought it was interesting that you brought that up. Uh, it's it's gonna be interesting to see what they do there. Uh, let's let's go, Lance. Why don't you rip off here? Uh, let's go. Where do we get to? We got to ten with the with yeah, we got to ten. Wait, let's so we get from the eleven. Jets. Let's get to 11 to 20. Get us 11 to 20 here, Lance, and we're going to call off all these names. And, and <laughs> if I had all my names of questions. If I had my names in front of me, I would rip them give it all to you? off. I got it. Yeah, I'll you've seen my you. setup. Give, you've I'll seen how I'm you. on video now. This is a I'll, miracle I'll I'm on video. Oh, my gosh. It's such a, it's such a ragtag operation. First of all, he's got, so if you is. can't see, if you're just listening right now, he, he's Lance, a stick mic. Lance has the karaoke microphone from a local <laughs> bar that he, that he stole. Um, Bob but, Barker. Uh, all right, I'll rip him off here. Mackay Becht into the Jets, the tackle from Louisville. Jerry Judy, Alabama receiver to the Raiders. Uh Kayla Von Chase on the edge rusher to the Colts. Jacob Eason was an interesting one. We'll circle mm-hmm. back to that to the Bucks. Mm-hmm. Quarterback from Washington. Andrew Thomas, tackle to Denver. Zach Bond, uh, the earliest I've seen him going to Atlanta at 16, mm. uh, who's an edge rusher from Wisconsin. Xavier McKinney, safety from Alabama to the Cowboys, who've been looking for that safety spot. Uh, DeAndre Swift to the Dolphins, which Dolphin uh, fans mm-hmm. and critics alike love that pick uh, by Lance there. Uh, Patrick Queen, linebacker to the Raiders. At 19, and then C.J. Henderson uh, goes to the Jags. So let, let me just start here, Lance. The team's with a couple picks. The Jags, you have Henderson at 20, mm-hmm. and you had their other one, you had Kinlaw. So they have Kinlaw, uh, and then Henderson is their two picks. And then when you look at the Raiders, you have the Raiders with Jerry Judy, which is a fun one, uh, as well as Patrick Queen. So uh, why don't you just explain those, the thinking there on the teams with multiple picks? Well, I think Ken Law is height, weight, speed, rare physical trait type of guy. And one of the things that, you know, Jacksonville was built with, their, their front was very, very dominant for a while. And they've kind of gotten away from that, where their, their front isn't as scary as it once was, nor is the secondary, obviously, especially with Jalen Ramsey out. So in this particular instance, you know, they've done some things to try to, to, to build up the offense. We know DJ Chark really came on. Um, you can say what you want about the quarterback situation, but they are, they are trying to address that over the last two years. So we'll see if that, if that sticks. They've spent money and draft capital on their offensive line. Well, let's take a look at the defense now. And Ken Law gives you that big, potentially uh, dominant, violent body in the middle of the defense, but he's still a little bit of a projection. With C.J. Henderson, I think C.J. Henderson, to me, has some of the same athletic attributes as A.J. Bouye, but he is 
even more fluid athletically. And, and I think his tape is so fun to watch because it really doesn't look like C.J. Henderson very much. You, you don't see many cornerbacks who move, who have the size that he has, who have, they have the twitch, the long speed. I, I really like C.J. Henderson, and I think this is a good pick for them to help shore up the back end of their defense um, if he's available at number 20. So Jags have to get better on defense. Frankly, I looked at it and said, let's just – as a unit, let's get better on the defensive side of the ball this year. You know, Lance? I like that. Yeah, I like Talk that. Thoughts. Yeah, because I think what he's doing is you're building on strength, like build strength on strength, meaning the Jaguars were at their best when the defense was kind of carrying the way. they got to make sure they get back to that. I am sure now that Dave Caldwell is back, kind of reinserted as the, the leader of team building, uh, I certainly think that they want to get back to getting those stars on the defense side of the ball. All right, the other question, I forgot about, yeah, obviously, the, the Miami Dolphins uh, with three first-rounders, so let's get you there. They have Tua. You have Tua going at five. Um, then we just mentioned you have DeAndre Swift at 18. Uh, and then we get to their last one, which is 26, is Josh Jones, the offensive tackle right. from Houston, um, who Lance has been a big proponent of and actually mm-hmm. got me to go back and do some more work on. And uh, one of the, there's always a handful of these guys where you're too high, too low early in the process. And, and Lance, you nailed that one because he was great at the Senior Bowl and uh, and definitely somebody that's in the first round mix. He was good in day. Scenario, he's gonna he go was good in two. day two. He struggled in day one, but I think that's important to note about the Senior Bowl. It's not unusual to see offensive linemen really struggle. I saw it with uh, Shaq Mason way back in the day when he was really not good in day one, and then day two and day three. He was so much better. That happens frequently with offensive linemen where they get a lot better in day two and day three than they are in, in, in day one once they get acclimated. But to, you know, to stay with Miami, Tua is the quarterback of the future, right? When I've got DeAndre Swift, who I think is the best running back in this draft, to kind of hold the water offensively uh, for the Dolphins while Tua redshirts, because in my world, he's redshirting. And then I need someone to take over the Laramie Tunsil spot. So in an ironic twist, I'm going to get the offensive lineman from the University of Houston after trading that and getting that pick from the Houston Texans. And so now I've got my left tackle of the future for my quarterback of the future, and i got a running back who can handle the heavy lifting. Now the analytics crew uh, is not a fan of that. And and truth be told, as somebody who watched – Really? I didn't know that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they're they're not big fans. And that. truth I be told, really like that. I, I, I'm not necessarily I, I'm not opposed to their line of thinking either. I was here in Houston with you know I, I live here and watched Alex Gibbs do his thing here. I'm a big fan of Terrell Davis and what was done there uh, in the Denver Broncos. Uh, I'm a big fan of of Arian Foster, an undrafted free agent who was the best running back in the league for a couple of years, or certainly one of the top mm-hmm. two, top three. So I understand you can find running backs. I'm not saying you can't. I do think there are certain running backs who are differentiators and when you have multiple picks that's when I actually like and this is one of the reasons I gave the Dolphins a running back if they had one pick in the round or even two picks I might have said eh they have so much draft capital that I'm going to go get a guy that I really like who's a three down back who doesn't have a lot of tread off the tires by the way over there in Georgia that's one of the reasons I actually I actually thought a little differently DJ with with running back at number 18 there yeah, uh, and it's interesting. I, w- I want to make this point because Buck, we've talked about this before, and I think this mm-hmm. gets lost. I, and because we, we've talked about the running backs, and Bucky specifically has talked about the value of a running back and how he doesn't necessarily agree with the the bullets that these guys take. The thing that I would say, and I think we're in agreement on this, Buck, we're not against. We're not like the people that say you shouldn't take running backs. I, and and everybody's come out and said. Uh, well, look, the, the Rams are now, there's a report out there, they're trying to trade Todd Gurley. David Johnson is going to get cut from, from the Arizona Cardinals. Le'Veon Bell, his second contract hasn't worked out. I'm not, I'm saying I'm okay with, with drafting one. I'm not okay with giving these guys ginormous extensions. They're one one contract guys. That to me is like, let, let's get them. You can even franchise them for a year. Melvin Gordon is another example of somebody who, uh, the second contract, you know, that, that whole thing that happened last year. So, Buck, are we are are you on the same page with me on this one in terms of I don't have, I don't have any hatred towards guys that want to take a running back early if they're going to win a bunch of games and ride them till the wheels fall off, but when you want to pay him money on the second contract, then I got a problem. Well, see, that was yeah, that was that was the entire point uh, that I would make. I, I think it's a smarter investment to draft a really good running back high, uh, take him to the term. So the terms of five year rookie deal. Well, in year going into year five draft another one high, 
and then let the guy that is previously established <laughs> go on. I mean, that's that's the way that um, it should be done. I'm, look, you're talking about a position where they take more bullets than any other position in football. And so I'm not opposed to drafting them high. I think the devaluation, the, the entire conversation um, bogs me down is when you don't want to draft them high and you don't want to pay him. At some point, I'm saying you have to invest in the talent. I just think it's better to invest it in the front end as opposed to the back end. Yeah, and I think something else here, DJ, that's important is that I would think that the analytics crew, because it is about value, I would think that people look at that first contract, yeah. and you see the amount on the first contract, and if a player, if player A is better than player B, now the argument is there's no difference. Well, Maybe in zone schemes you can find those kind of guys. you got to have one cut, vision, courage, and burst. That's what you need. But I think if you want a guy to carry the – do the heavy lifting and carry your offense, uh, there is a tremendous potential value in having one contract – that lasts six potential years because when you amortize the amount of money over six years, even if you give them a, even if you give them a, a franchise year, which is not a ridiculous number on the franchise year, the value that you're getting out of that first contract until they're age 28 is pretty strong. So I think that's one of the things I would argue in favor of Swift to the to the Dolphins. Yeah, and look, th- this is a year that's interesting because there is pretty good depth here at the running back position, so maybe that would uh, lead people to push the running backs down a little bit lower. I, I also, um, there's a-, a theory out there, too, that you don't want to draft that running back until you're ready to win because you want his five good years to be worth something instead of throwing away his best years on a bad team. You want your you, you want your, your best back to be dropped in once you have a team that's ready to win. So, yeah, I, uh, interesting I agree talk there on running sure. backs. All right, let's get, let's get to the end. Of, I'll get to the rest of the, the mock draft here then and we'll have a brief discussion then we'll move on uh we get to 21 cd lamb to the eagles what a steal that would be t higgins to the bills uh receiver from clemson going to buffalo uh center caesar ruiz from michigan going to the patriots uh henry ruggs uh, I will I will put a side bet with Lance that he will not get to pick number 24 <laughs> with the New Orleans Saints. Uh, number 25, Jalen Johnson, corner from Utah. I really like him going to the Vikings. Josh Jones, we mentioned, going to the Dolphins, the big tackle. A.J. Epinesa, interesting mm-hmm. player, edge rusher from uh, Iowa, going to Seattle. Kenneth Murray, the linebacker, going to the Ravens. They love Oklahoma players. Cam Dantzler, a uh, new name out there. Uh, some people might not be as familiar with him. The corner yep. from Mississippi State going to the Titans. Justin Jefferson, another wide out from LSU going to the Packers. Jonathan Taylor running back from Wisconsin goes to the Chiefs. They get even faster. And Trevon Diggs, the corner from Alabama, goes to the 49ers. Bucky, I'll, I'll, looking at that list there, what stands out to you? Well, what stands out to me, um, a couple things. Like the corners, uh, we always talk about the run on corners and when that's going to happen. And I think when you see a Jalen Johnson going to the Minnesota Vikings, uh, Trevon Diggs going to the San Francisco 49ers, and then Dantzler going to the Tennessee Titans, as much as we talk about um, the offensive guys, I think more and more teams are not only seeing the value of these long athletic corners, but guys have to be able to play man-to-man. Uh, where we used to talk about zone corners and ball hawks and those things, right now you have to have the decathletes on the outside. And in each of the guys that uh, Lance has kind of inserted and slotted into the mock draft, all long arms, great athletes, guys that kind of excel at playing man-to-man. I think the league has been trending that way, but even now more than ever we're seeing more teams play man-to-man. These corners that we're evaluating, a little less about ball skills and more about – the quickness, the length, and the ability to play man-to-man. Look, long arm, tall, they're all six feet also. So you're talking about six-foot corners with long arms that that play man. That's what goes in the first round if they're talented enough. And and I think, um, you know, with well, let me go through each of them very, very quickly, starting off with Jalen Johnson. Jalen Johnson, to me, has what you want. He just, in terms of staying in phase, he's still – He's still a little almost top-heavy. His momentum just carries him a little bit. So I think there are different ways that you can play him and get maximum value, but he's physical, he's smart, and he can make plays on the football. Um, I'm going to go Diggs, who was the last pick, before I get back to Dantzler, because I want a little bit longer with Dantzler. Diggs, I really love Diggs. I just think there are certain... There are certain matchups that are going to be a little trickier for him, but he's, if for being a big corner, he's very athletic. And I think if you're San Francisco, you can look at mm-hmm. Diggs and say, look, he can fit the Richard Sherman model. You can play him cover three and take over for Richard Sherman, but you can roll him into a free safety role, I think. Um, 
He's got the size. I think he's tough enough. So the instincts, I believe, are, are there enough to play that as well. So if you're drafting Diggs for me, and they did this with Traverius Moore, you say, okay, with Moore they said he's a safety who we're going to try to play corner. With Diggs, I'd say, let's play him at corner, and if we need to or want to in the future, let's roll him over to safety. Yeah, he could he could fail his way into playing safety, but I, I just think, to me, you put him in like a zone in a zone scheme where he can use his length, his instincts, and his ball skills. As a former receiver, obviously everybody knows Stephon Diggs' uh, brother there. He's got phenomenal ball skills. So oh, I, I like him when he's got his eyes on the quarterback and can see back through the receiver. So uh, you look at a team, you look at the Seattle scheme that is all over the league right now, Yep. I think they're gonna love him, Buck. Yeah, so that's why when you when you have that, like look for those teams. Like I know we we have them uh slotted to Jacksonville right now. CJ Henderson. Atlanta, the Chargers. Yeah, but I mean there's so many different ways where he could go. He may be valued more than some people on the outside would recognize just because when it comes down to fit and scheme, his length, his ball skills, his athleticism certainly fits into that cover three system that Seattle has made famous. Uh, Bucky, I want to ask you this because I, I hear this a lot from fans. And, and if you're a casual viewer on TV, I can understand the problem you have with this. When you see a lot of cover three stuff and you see the, the side shuffle and they're way back off the receiver and it looks like easy throws and you're giving them easy money all day long – why do defensive coordinators and why do teams prefer – can you talk about that scheme for a second and, and who fits it and why they fit it? So so the reason why the scheme has been so popular is because, like, what Pete Carroll and, and those guys did is they created basically a, a, a matchup zone – uh, when they made that hybrid cover three system. So what they did is they played uh, cover three is basically three deep defenders, four underneath defenders. Seattle changed it by putting their corners and basically press or press bail where they took away the easy throws on the outside and they had their corners execute what is called a read technique where they're kind of looking through number two, the inside receiver. If he goes vertical, they go vertical. If not, they just kind of match up and play man-to-man on their guys. The reason why you want the Richard Sherman type corner is because when you think about putting your best corner into the boundary into the short side of the field what you want them to do is to be able to jam disrupt lock up and then because they're always kind of trailing the length enables them to get those breakups and pbus and also make plays on tips and overthrows and so that's why it's imperative that in that system you have those long six foot corners that force quarterbacks to make these tight window throws and those their length makes them overthrow it which leads to more interceptions or tips and deflections all right, get 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 to Dantzler. Get to your little love child there, Lance. All right, you're so glowing Cam behind you. It's, it's only fitting that the, the your, your your video shot right now. You're literally it's just a floating face because you're wearing a white <laughs> shirt with a white, <laughs> white background. And it's like you're a, you're in a heavenly body right now. Uh, and it's only fitting as you talk about Dantzler. There we go. I'll just get the <laughs> zip so I have the entire entire look going. So Cam Dantzler, uh, first and foremost, Tennessee's probably going to reach out and say, hey. Uh, Simmons, what do you know about your teammate, Dantzler? And Dantzler's well-liked on the, the team from what I've been told. So Simmons will give him you know, a plus when it comes to Tennessee. Tennessee has a need at cornerback as well, whatever. What I really like about Cam Dantzler is he's another one of these six one corners, very, very long. Now, he's in a 180-pound range. He's about 184, 185. That's going to bother some teams, and I totally get it. What really surprised me when I watched tape – was when I turned on the LSU tape, because the good thing about having a, a, a cornerback from the SEC is I get to watch them against, sometimes I get to watch them against Joe Burrow and Tua. And this was the case with Cam Dantzler. I was able to watch these incredible wide receivers from, from A&M, I mean uh, from LSU, and these incredible wide receivers from Alabama with one cornerback. And let me tell you, they completed three passes for 21 yards on him combined both teams and Jamar Chase did not get off get not get off press very well at all Cam Dantzler for being a 180 something pound cornerback is very strong at the point of attack and he can really jam up and slow down and redirect the route and that's what he did to Jamar Chase on multiple occasions now truth be told college officials let you get away with murder for cornerbacks and if you've watched a lot of tape any of the guys here can tell you that it's amazing what what is allowed to take place but he did this within the first five yards which i thought was pretty impressive teams went away from him he's got ball skills he's got range he's got pretty good speed um i wish he were in the 194 pound range in that neighborhood he's not 
he's not the toughest in run support I've seen, but he's okay. But I think his ability to 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 kind of Darius slay this and and play one on one, man to man, physical and with length, to me. I think you'll hear more and more talk about Cam Dantzler. I have already heard from a team that doesn't love him because of the size and they're worried about durability, and I get that, but I'm trying to find guys who can make plays on the football who are long and who fit the mode that we've been talking about. So he's on my circle back list, Buck. Uh, he's on my circle back list. I did. I have not seen either one of those games. I did him early in the, in the process, and I did him against the powerhouses of Louisiana Lafayette and Southern Miss. Uh, so those are the two tapes that I watched. And my notes that I have is very aware, instinctive in zone, a nice pick against Lafayette. Um, he's very fluid when he opens up. Uh, he flashes that aggressive two-hand jam that, uh, that Lance was referring to, very tall, very lean. Uh, but here were the two things in that game that bothered me. Number one, his feet widen in press, which is a really bad habit when that happens. You've got to break that because you're dead. If, you, if you're, your first step is both your feet hop out, that's 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 a poor habit. So he's got to clean that up. The other thing was he lost a 50-50 ball in that game. Um, so with somebody with his size and length, that was a, I didn't love seeing that. Uh, and then in Southern Miss, he actually ended up getting hurt in that game, uh, but played well. Um, I just thought sometimes when he's on blocks, he's just he played he just play strength was a little bit of a concern there when he get locked up a little bit that way. So I liked him. I didn't love him, but I will definitely go back and watch uh, the, the better opponents they played later on in the year. And that's the other thing about what we do is that we have to get started earlier. So some of their best mm -hmm. opponents and some of the toughest opponents aren't until later in the year. And so that is a tricky part because there's a Kansas guard uh, tackle to guard that I, I'm just kind of so-so on. But there's that's some NJ. other people. Yeah, some other I people like who, really, who really like him. And so I looked at him early on. I need to go back and watch him later as well. That's, that's, not, un, that's not unusual. There will probably be eight to ten players like that. I need to go back on Troutman, watch him a little bit more, uh, the tight end. So oh. that's not unusual for that to happen. Okay, I got one. I have a name because I was wondering if I was crushing out on my, on my, on my own. Yesterday, so I, I popped in the tape of Jordan Elliott from Missouri. Ooh, love him. Okay, and so I'm sitting here, and I'm like, ooh, we first step quickness, burst, plays at angles, movement. I just see him do all of this active stuff. So then I'm like, well, let me go see the production. And the production, in terms of sack production and stuff, is not there. He only has five and a half career sacks. Mm -hmm. And so in my notes, I'm like, man, is he a boom or bust guy? Because he is talented. There's no denying the talent. The way that he moves, the way he's active, he works angles. And then I did, dug a little deep, and I knew he was a, tra he was a transfer from Texas. Uh, they talked about his immaturity. But I mean, Lance, I, I'm sure, DJ, I don't know if you've seen him yet, but this, this kid. I did him, yeah. Yeah, this, this, this kid is talented, and I'm sitting here saying, like, going into the combat, like, who's someone who could be one of those slept-on guys that kind of rises up the ranks? I just believe Jordan Elliott from Missouri, number one in the program, number one in your hearts as well. Like, he is, he's a dude. I liked him. I'll jump I in. I watched real three games. I watched, I watched, go ahead, Lance, go ahead. Well, I. So I liked him as well. I gave him a, what would be a high 6-3, which is a second-round pick. I think he's really talented. I saw the same things you did. I was a little worried about the rush production. I talked to his D-line coach who coached uh, for years, we coached with the Chicago Bears, for example, in the NFL. And he, we talked about his hand usage because I'm sure that stood out to you as well, Buck. He is, yeah. he's, 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 he's nice with the hands, and it that's man, not yeah. always the case. And he's got big hands. He's nice with them. He's quick. You can see he's skilled. His D-line coach says, oh, he's going to get better with the hands. But they had some read and react stuff that they were doing, and so I think he's going to get better as a pass rusher. I don't think he's going to be a great pass rusher. I think he'll be solid, but I think he is really going to be um, a, a tough guy to deal with on early downs mm -hmm. as a run stopper. And, you know, that's no different than Jerron Reed was and Ashawn Robinson when they were second-round picks. So, uh, and, and, this, and he's lost weight from when he transferred. Yeah, he, he was, was 345. Yeah, he was a big boy, and he looks good now. He looks good on the hoof. So um, I think he's one of those guys, to me, that is a solid second-round defensive tackle, one of the guys that I'd circle as well as a player that I'd, that I'd want. I did him the other day. He, right now, when I look at my stack, he's between 50 and 60 for me, which puts him middle to late second round where mm -hmm. I have him. Mm -hmm. And I agree with a lot of the stuff you guys said. Um, little, he, he plays up and down the line of scrimmage, um, stack and shed. He's got, he can penetrate. He's quick. Uh, flashes a little one-arm stab and, and, uh, and finish there. They move him out. I, I like him, man. I mean, 
and sometimes they move him off the edge. I didn't think he had enough juice uh, to come mm-hmm. off there when they used him over there. And the only other, the only thing I, I dinged him on a little bit was uh, the Georgia game. I, I thought his effort was a little spotty in that one, which which those guys, man, I love it if they could uh, go all out when they can limit your snaps a little bit. But uh, I watched Georgia, Missouri, Arkansas, and uh, Lance. You gave him a six three. I have him as a six two. So he's right. He's right. We're we're speaking the same language. Yeah, that's right funny because you guys go at worst. He's going to go in the second round, Buck. He's yeah, that's no, the worst case. That's funny. So according to the old grading scale we use in Seattle, I gave him a six nine, which is kind of like top of the second round. Uh, it's it's kind of like not yeah. to the line, but it's it's in that top forty stuff. And I think um, when I look at the athleticism. Uh, Because it's just hard to find guys at that size that have the movement skills in that short area. And then you throw the fact that he is he is a bit of a Mr. Miyagi when it comes to his hands. He has all that wax on wax off Mm -hmm. stuff. And it's just hard to find young guys who have that. So when you come in the league already knowing how to use your hands, it just gives you an advantage. Um, he is just one to kind of keep an eye on him because there's always kind of like a, a flood of these underclassmen that you kind of lose sight of some guys. He's one that I think people need to kind of keep an eye on because he could be one of those surprise picks that people are like, who, what? But everyone inside kind of understands what he could bring to the table. How would you guys compare him to Blacklock if you've done him from TCU? Because I, I like Blacklock a little bit better than him. I thought it was a pretty, pretty uh, decent I, gap I, there. I think Blacklock from TCU. is – Yeah, Blacklock is a guy that I – the one thing I worry about is he's not a big guy. And he is, at least this year, he's lighter this year than he had been the year previous. And he's got some some medical stuff in his background as well. He hasn't played a lot of football, frankly. Um, tremendous. My joker is twitched up, man. Tremendous lateral quickness. Tremendous ability to gap it up. I think they're very different players, though, because Jordan Elliott is a grown man. So you want to come downhill at him, you're going to have your hands full. With Blacklock, I thought Blacklock struggled when people got downhill on him. But if he's in a gap and if he's in the right scheme, which you assume, you know, teams that that, that recognize his strengths are going to ha- run that kind of defense. So I think Blacklock is the only the only problem I have is I think that Jordan Elliott holds up against NFL size. Blacklock, to me, I'm still a little bit concerned because I saw him get pushed around and moved around um, a little bit. You know, I think he comps with, was it Tristan Hill who came from uh, uh, UCF? UCF yeah. That's who he reminded me oh, of a little he's bit. Better than, he's better he's, than Tristan no, Hill, Lance. He's Stop. better. He's better. But I just said a guy who, fla- who pops up and flashes because Tristan Hill was a pretty – I thought Tristan Hill was a pretty good player last year. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was an interesting prospect. So, and, and looking at my grades on both guys, because in Blacklock, um, I talked about big athletic, high motor, 100% effort guy, loved his first step quickness, explosive, quick hands, feet. I saw him as a one-gap penetrator because he was so active at the line of scrimmage, strong versus a run, good hands and uh, stacking shit. Interestingly, I had Jordan Elliott at a 6'9", and Black. Blacklock at a 6-5. So that would be the difference between a top of the second round and a middle of the second round in that old uh, Seattle Seahawks grading scale. By the way, DJ, I was not talking about Blacklock and Tristan. I was talking about Jalen and Tristan. Um, Elliot. I mean, Jordan Elliott. Oh, I think oh, I Jordan Elliott and oh, Tristan. Oh, oh I body, thought you were talking about Blacklock. No, no, no. Yeah. Body type-wise, they kind of remind me the same. You he, know, he, I think they play similar. He flexed on you, Lance. He flexed on yeah, you. Yeah, no. He, he thought I was getting a, That's his man. Like, Blacklock, Blacklock is his guy bold, now. Kinda, you got to watch him. Yeah, he kind of bowed up yeah, on here. my crush. Thing. Here's my thing. <laughs> When I go, when I go, look, and I, I saw, I saw Iowa State, I saw Blacklock get crushed by some double teams in that game. But when I go back through my notes and I see words like burst, twitch, explosive, in all caps, several times, like that to me is that's the NFL. Well, that's what I want, man. I give me disruptors, give me guys that are going to be difference makers on the other side of the line of scrimmage. And this dude, all my notes littered through here is about how twitched up, explosive, and and juicy this guy is. I, that's. It, that's my that's my he's cup a, of tea for life. He's of a, a little polarizing, phrase. though, to be honest with you, DJ. It's funny talking to some different scouts. Some people really love him, and some people are are a little concerned. Now, I also think that has to do with what defense you run, because I think he he is a one gap up the field type of guy. That's who he is. You're not going to like him. You know, you're not going <laughs> to like him if you're on a defense. So you want guys to make plays. Yeah, he fits your scheme. You're going to like him a little uh, here bit. Here we go, yeah, Bucky. This is two his, totally different schools of thought. I know. Two, you can I know. have totally different. This is your guy. I get it. You can I put, get it. You can put your little red star on him. Yeah. So red star, red star for DJ. <laughs> I know. On, on Black Lock. So so we know. Guys, so, who who wants to talk about Blacklock? I'll take him. I'll, I'll take, take him. him. I got him. Yeah, let me I get him. in this segment. <laughs> 
<laughs> Com- com- combine coverage is going to be great when he steps to the line. That's a guy, man. Oh, guy, he better test well, or I'm gonna, I might jump out of the booth. DJ, I, now, well. DJ, this uh, is a guy that you really like here, don't you? You know, Rich Eisen is going to put it up on a tee. He's going to serve it up for him. <laughs> God, it's funny. Oh, it's too good. All right, let's. Uh, I wanted to do a couple of these other discussions here, real quick, but guys, I know we're running out of time, so we're going to have to ditch them. But uh, just one quick thought, Buck, on. Uh, on the importance of marrying up your free agent board with the draft board and, and take people behind the curtain a little bit of what takes place when you're going through these free agency meetings as we go into draft meetings. And so, so DJ, if we, we think about it, like say the three of us are all working together. And so let's just say I'll be the pro director, Lance, you're the college director, and DJ will let you be the general manager. So as we're sitting in the room and we're beginning to talk about, hey, what are our off-season plans? Naturally, DJ, you'll come to me with a question about, like, hey, what's out there in free agency at – offensive tackle and I'm gonna tell you hey it there's not a lot here the guys that are here are probably your backup types or whatever that conversation then will go from you talking to Lance Lance what's available in the the market when it comes to offensive tackles hey this is a really good draft for us offensive tackles where does it get thin at can we find a guy that potentially could start in the second and the third round and then with that information it begins to help you kind of hone in on what are our strategies? What do we want to do in the offseason? We have a, a, a ton of holes to fill. Are we better to use our capital and free agency? Or would it be better to say, hey, there's more than enough for us to get in the draft. Let's find another position in free agency to target. So it's that conversation trying to assess the supply and demand in the free agent market, uh, where the pro department comes in, and then also having that same conversation, supply and demand, when it comes to the draft. Then you take all of the information, you try and put a plan in place that enables you to really fortify your squad using the best means for whatever position. And Lance, ideally, you want to use free agency to at least have placeholders at every position if you can. You might not, have, not love what you have, but you can line up and play a game. To me, that if you go into the draft, the teams that are in the best shape are the teams that go into the draft in April that can line up and play a game. As, 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 as silly as that sounds, mm-hmm. but they have enough right now they can line up and play, which frees you up to uh, you know not to not be you know beholden to taking this exact position uh, early in the draft or you can't line up and play so that that's what the challenge is for these teams in free agency. So as someone who has had to put together team needs um, for NFL.com, I, I didn't have to do it last year, and luckily I haven't had to do it this year. I will before the draft, but I used to have to do it before free agency, and then after free agency, you're like, well, no, it's you got to hit complete. Everything that you expected to be a need, yeah. you know, 60% of them, you start saying, well, now I'm not sure if this one's a need anymore. It kind of is, but kind of is it. And I think that's the, that's the point. Teams don't want to be predictable. A, they don't want to be, as you mentioned, beholden to a position. But if you can get, you know, there's placeholders and then there's average starters or slightly below average starters. And then there's guys, you know, you, you, you could still follow up at that position and say, let's get a guy – that we can, you know, make him competition, and we expect him to win what we would consider a six-two or a six-three player, maybe who could be a starter within, uh, you know, within two years. This guy can be in here and starting. So once you have free agency taken care of, and you know that you can go into the draft without being predictable, it also allows you the freedom of maneuvering around without having teams know exactly what you need. You know, here with the Houston Texans, for example. Everyone in the world knew they had to have a tackle. So they're sitting there, and, and they're just sitting there like a, a lame duck. And Andre Dillard is falling to them. And I thought Juwan Taylor was as well, although he wasn't a left tackle. And apparently the Texans didn't like No one in the first round liked him enough to take him in the first. But it was easy uh, for the – yeah, but the, it was easy for the Eagles to know, well, we just got to get ahead of the Texans. There's no question what they have to do. They have mm-hmm. to do that. And uh, I think it's important that – you do operate in such a way that you don't have to be desperate on draft day. You really don't want to, and that's what free agency allows you to do. But we know some teams will go get the Tier 1 guys, and I think the smart teams are the ones who go get the Tier 2 guys uh, because second wave is where you find your best deals. But you got to have them. I mean, you absolutely have to have them. You just got to no make doubt. you just got to make good decisions. You have to be able to weigh both of them, and you hope that you can make uh, a plan that enables you to cover all your bases and maybe get some upgrades while, along the way. I want to ask you guys this because I had a team tell me this: they believe in getting the board set as quickly as possible, so scouts cannot get wishy washy and change grades because 
they start scouting with their ears and they start getting impacted by what they hear. They want their grades turned oh, yeah. in and up there. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, it's smart. I mean, that's what every team does. I, we were going to you know, do a longer discussion on this. We can save it for another day. But the, the Cliff Notes version is it's, it's, it's the anchoring philosophy, right? You want to get the board up, and so there's an anchor that's set. And that way you can't drift. You're going to change. Guys are going to move around on that board as you get more information. You see, get official heights and weights on the underclassmen, see these guys all run, um, get a chance to interview them. You're going to have movement. You're going to have more people come in and watch, and that can influence the board. But I'll tell you what, when you get the board set up there right now, which teams are doing before the combine, the anchor is set, Buck, and so then you're not going to have guys that you have in the sixth round uh, you know, range for you know teams that do it round wise end up in the first round. You're not. They might go from the sixth round to the fourth round. You might go from the 75th player to the 55th player, uh, but you're not going to have that dramatic swing because you've got it anchored up to the board. Yeah, I think that's it, uh, DJ. We we've talked about it. Like, uh, I'm a big believer that you should put the pin down after the senior bowl. After that senior ball, the final snap, after you go through the tape, whatever it is you feel on the player, after that point, put your pen down and don't make any adjustments to your notes or anything like that. Because what happens is now we're in the part where it now becomes a track meet. And so those big, beautiful bodies and guys running up and down the thing, the decathletes, all those guys have a tendency to rise if you hadn't put the pen down, you haven't submitted your grade because you fall in love with the athleticism and you forget about how they played. And I think the teams that are the best drafters keep the focus on how a player plays. How did they play that final season? How did they play the previous seasons leading up to that? The farther you get away from the regular season, the more likely the mistakes are to be made. That's why as soon as the senior bowl is done, within a week or so, put the pin down. Don't allow the combine and pro day workouts to impact and influence what your final grade will be. There you go. Uh, fun discussion there. Fun episode. Uh, Lance, we appreciate you joining us. Bucky, heck of an effort by you uh, getting through the uh, I Look, I waited, I waited the through the traffic. The parking, the, the, lot. the parking lot. The parking lot had me uh, jammed up. Lance, uh, I'll let you go back to your heavenly home there as you continue to glow on my screen right oh. now. Um, <laughs> I'm waiting, uh, waiting for you to <laughs> just float off the screen here. Uh, by the way, Lance, before we go, um, oh. what would uh, – uh, can you just give me a little taste here? I, I just need a little – I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Just do uh, it. I, I know, but can, can you do – can you read my report on – or just, just – could you, uh, you, you don't have my report in front of you, but if you could just talk about my opinion about Blacklock in my favorite voice, please. Former L.A. Dodger and Houston Astro Jose Lima? That would be correct. Blacklock is unbelievable. <laughs> he's, he, he's so fast. He's got a lot of twitch. He can get in the gaps big time. And then sometimes he gets knocked down by big guys. So what? It doesn't matter. Because why? He's in the backfield. <laughs> All of the time, bro. If you want to win games, you better draft him in the top six. He's better than Derek Brown. Believe it. <laughs> oh, it's the best Jose Lima. It's my favorite. I need it's that. It's the I only that. Jose oh, Lima. Whoa, 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 whoa. I almost dropped the lead. How did I no, drop the Okay, we got to go, guys. Don't even hey, say it. Do so, it. So now do it. it hasn't been look, finalized. My, wh- it what? hasn't been finalized. The Dodgers. Look. It is DJ's nightmare. Mookie Betts, this is David Price going to the Dodgers. It's not too late, DJ. What number do you prefer? Because I'm going to go to the stadium <laughs> and get some season tickets. So I'm trying to figure out what number jersey do you want? What do you want on your back when you come and we go to Love You Blue route? Like, like what Like what would work? What would work for you? Oh, man. This is so gross. I, I just know this. Hey, Lance, I'm going to have a birthday party um, <laughs> next year. It's going to be it's gonna be late October. Yeah. I figured we could have it at Dodger Stadium because they won't be playing at that point in time. They, 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 like they always, nice. they always play. So but maybe you join but, me there. We'll have a good time. Sure, but yeah. are, are you talking about your two-time oh. back-to-back World Series champions because of the cheating allegations that we now have, so we been, actually that have been lost. Con- Stop. confirmed? That we the actually Astros, lost the second one. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't you know? actually win the second one. <laughs> <laughs> and it was never going to be a back-to-back. It was going to be two out of three years. All right. It was never going to be. Back. And Jose and, hey, was, and Jose Altuve held the jersey because he's a modest person. <laughs> I don't want to hear all these conspiracy theories about buzzers. Buddy, Bucky asked me if I was going to get electrocuted at the Senior Bowl if it's yeah. raining. Yeah. He thought I was going to get electrocuted. We don't all wear buzzers on I, our because from Houston. I'm just saying. I had to, I had to actually I had to get I had to get in my Bible and ask for forgiveness because I I had this come over me, Buck, of 
I really desire for some of these Dodgers to get hurt just so that I don't have to listen to them win the World <laughs> Series. And I don't know how they're not going to win wow. one now with what they have. I mean, and it was a thought, and, and it was it was a lot of guilt. It was immediately <laughs> guilt. I confessed. I confessed my sins and my impure thoughts. And uh, and I wish the Do- Dodgers nothing but the best. So I, I actually there was a lot of guilt involved there because my immediate reaction was, oh man, Walker Bueller, just just trip on a curb or something and just you know twist that yeah. ankle a little bit. And I thought that's mm. not very Christian. Like I, I shouldn't no, say just that. just no. hope for a slump. Do that. Just, like the rest yeah. of us, hope for a slump. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a lot of uh, fun. A lot of fun. Uh, pitchers and catchers. Awful. Well, pitchers and catchers. Good luck. We've got Dusty Baker now. All right. What a what, – yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Lance, I told Lance the other day, I said, as a Padre fan, I might be the only person that doesn't live in the city of Houston that would actually root for the Astros if they played the Dodgers. <laughs> Over the Dodgers, <laughs> that's yeah. How, that's how, I've been that's making Dusty like Baker is a, is, a, yeah. is a substitute yeah. teacher jokes here on the radio because that's what he is. They're just like, oh, when do we get our regular teacher back? <laughs> I mean, Lance, if you can get if you can get me, hold, I, I've practiced here. If you can get me some tickets, like somewhat close to the diamond, or actually put me out in the outfield because I can do this. Curveball, curveball, curveball. Change does that up. get me? Does that, does that get me tickets in the outfield there? You no, guys? you gotta get closer. <laughs> you gotta get closer. You gotta be down close by the by the they first won't hear base it. side. They won't hear it. That's true. Yeah, what are you talking That's about? True. You can be That's way true. out there. I don't know. God. Well, obviously, I'm a Padre fan. We don't know how to cheat. We stink. Uh, maybe if we cheated a obviously. little bit better, we'd be better. Obviously. All right, so let's fun. get out of here. This is All this right. could go on forever. Thanks a lot, Buck, for ruining my day. I didn't do uh, it. That's going to do it for us today. <laughs> Bucky, Lance, DJ, hopefully this trade is not finalized. We'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks. <laughs>